for reading that. Okay. Therefore, my brothers, oh, this is Philippians 4, 1 through 9, sorry. Okay. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entrust Eodia and entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, companion, help these women who have labored side to side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guide your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think of these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the Lord of peace will be with you. Let us pray. Um, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, um, thank you for another day that you gave us, Lord. Thank you for uh, a time that we can gather again and just uh, worship you and continue to grow more in you, Lord. I pray that through the words that's going to be uh, spoken today, that we can, uh, our hearts be filled with your love, with your truth, and that we can share that love and truth uh, to others, Lord. And at this moment, Lord, Heavenly Father, we please give us eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to, to believe. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Hey, well, good morning, Grove Church. It's, uh, man, it's a, a privilege to be, uh, to be here preaching this morning at my home church. Uh, this has been our home, my wife and my, my three kids, for the last five years. This July will be five years that we've been here, which feels crazy to say. Time has flown by. Um, but uh, we love this church. From the day we, literally the day we arrived uh, we had um, a family bring us a meal, uh, and uh, we've been at this church ever since and have been a part of this body, and so um, we really love this church and what God's doing in and through the Grove. So a privilege to be able to preach. So um, let's jump into the text, Philippians 4, 1 through 9. I want to start out by asking if anybody here ever read the book or seen the movie called Unbroken? Anybody remember Okay, like three people. That's great. Started off with a uh, obscure book, so we're off to a good start. Uh, but I appreciate you that raised your hand. Uh, so, the the book the mo- in the movie Unbroken it's it's about it's a biography. It's about the life of a man named Louis Zamperini, and Louis lived this extraordinary life. It's actually kind of hard to believe. Kind of like to fact check some of it, to be honest. That's my, how I how my brain works, but. Louis lived this, this kind of ridiculous life, and towards the end of his life, he became a believer. But um, Louis was an Olympian, uh, an Olympic runner. He ran in the 1936 Olympic Games, competed in the long distance, like 5,000 meter or something like that, long distance, yeah? yeah? Getting ahead, not. And he ended up placing eighth place in the Olympics. Well, right after, shortly after those games, World War II began, and um, Louis decided to uh, fight for his country. He enlisted in the army, and um, he, he joined to, uh, to fight in World War II. So shortly after training, Louis gets shipped off to, to, to the war. Like I said, kind of a crazy story, but he ends up getting shipwrecked at some point and is floating at sea for like 40-something days. Okay? Louis gets captured, he gets rescued, but ultimately he gets rescued and captured by the Japanese. And he's uh, placed into a POW, a prisoner of war camp with a bunch of other Americans. While he's in this camp, I mean, and this is a, you know, like POW camps are, it was uh, a really terrible place, right? Not much food, 
Um, so the mal malnourished, these guys were working hard physical labor in a coal mine, in a coal factory. So it was just all day and all, you know, as, as long as they were up there working hard, rigorous job. It was during this time that Louis got singled out one day by a particularly gruesome guard by the name of the bird, right? And if you guys have seen this, you remember probably this scene from the movie, but the bird singles out Louis and calls him out into the yard while everyone else is working, and he tells Louis to pick up this large, heavy wooden beam, and he tells Louis to pick this beam up and hold it over his head. And remember, Louis has not eaten hardly anything, right? He's He's been working these hard physical job in a coal mine. He tells Louis to pick this beam up and hold it over his head, and he grabs another guard with a rifle, and he tells him, point that rifle at Louis, and if he drops that beam, shoot him, kill him. So Louis, in the face of all of this, stands there. He barely is able to get, lift this thing, but somehow he's able to hold this beam up and above his head, and he does it for 37 minutes. 37 minutes standing there until ultimately the bird gets so angry and frustrated with his defiance that he comes over with his baton and he just starts beating Louis. Right? Louis drops the beam and, and he just starts beating him. Paul, Paul begins this passage that Alex and Becca just read. He begins this passage by telling us and the Philippians to stand firm in the Lord. As I began to prepare for this message, that image of Louis, for some reason, kept coming to my mind, right? This idea of resilience, determination in the face of fear and worry and opposition. But unlike Louis, we're not left to fight alone and muster up enough energy to, to battle it out. Paul is going to tell us in this text, in this text exactly how to stand firm in the Lord. But why do we need to stand firm? I mean, what's at stake? The church in Philippi was dealing with all kinds of issues, issues going on, such as persecution, division, legalism, opposition to the gospel. And like the church in Philippi, we too, here at the Grove Church in Richmond, Texas, we're dealing with all kinds of opposition as well. Right? We live in a society that more and more believes that this Bible is hate speech. Right? Our kids are living in a time, even here in the, the Bible Belt south of Texas, there, our kids are living in a time where there's a cost to being a Christian at school. Right? We're bombarded with media and ads that tell us, <clears throat> with ads that tell us we need this new product to fulfill our lives. The battle for our hearts is very real. I believe Paul gives us three reasons that we need to stand firm from this text, and, and we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at the text to see what he has to say and how we can apply it to our lives today. So the title of my sermon is Stand Firm, and I have three points that I believe Paul has given us straight from this text. Point number one, stay on mission. Stay on mission. Paul begins by calling out two ladies in the church by name, which is like, dang, right? I mean, for all of time, Yodia and uh, Syntyche are called out by Paul. They, these two ladies were having a very public disagreement. Paul, Paul, I don't believe Paul was calling them out by name because they were so disruptive and so unruly and at risk for tearing the church apart. He calls them out by name because these ladies were vital to the gospel work going on in the church of Philippi, right? He says that these two labored side by side with me in the gospel. These two ladies are vital to gospel advancement in Philippi. We don't know what their disagreement was about. He doesn't tell us. It doesn't really matter. The fact is these ladies were in a very public battle, a public disagreement, and it was distracting them and others at that church from the mission. See, notice the communal aspect of this call out. Paul, he pleads with the entire church community, help these women. He says, help these women get this disagreement resolved. The communal aspect of this is very important. When we, when we sign up to become partners here at the Grove Church, 
we're signing up, we're also agreeing to holding each other accountable. Right? There's a, there's a communal aspect to this, the keeping each other from being distracted, from quarreling, and staying on mission, and f- staying focused on the mission. This isn't a fancy Sunday club, right, where we're pooling our money together to make some fancy building that our kids might get married in one day. Right? Maybe, maybe we'll have a building one day. Maybe we won't. We don't know. Maybe we'll always be setting up chairs every Sunday. We'll do it gladly. That's part of the mission, right? It's part of the mission. But what we're doing when we're partnering at the Grove is we're locking arms to do gospel work together, right? That's the point of this. We're locking arms to do gospel work. And anything that distracts us from that work, it's got to be eradicated. It has to be handled and taken care of. That's why we have church discipline. It's why God's given us elders that Look over our body and help us, right? Help us battle through issues. It's important. It's vital. We're on mission. Romans 12, 18, Paul says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is something we tell our kids all the time. You can only control you, right? So when Paul says, so far as it depends on you, it means you can only control you, But it also highlights the importance that Paul places on unity among brothers, the brothers and sisters in Christ. Do all that you can do to maintain peace, not only at home or work, but also with your church family. It's it's an important part of staying on mission. Paul then goes on to say, rejoice in the Lord always. And he repeats it again. He says, and then again I say, rejoice, right? Paul reminds the readers again because he's been saying it throughout the letter to to the church. He reminds them again that our lives must be ones of joy. Our joy comes from the Lord, and it is in the Lord. Joy is the mark of a believer. There's no such thing or should be no such thing as a grumpy Christian. Jesus tells us in John 15, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Paul says in Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. These are just a few of the many examples throughout Scripture where joy is shown as a mark of the believer. My my 91-year-old grandma, she recently lost her husband of 69 years, my, my Papa Ward. And... It's been a little over a year since he passed. It was a pretty unexpected passing, even though he was, you know, he was up there in age. Um, when I call her still to this day to check on her, she's still, she's still sad. She misses her husband. She misses her best friend. And she, and she talks about it. You won't, talk, you won't have a conversation with my, my mama ward, as we call her. You won't have a talk with her for very long before she begins to remind you and herself of all the things the Lord has done for her, right? She, she preaches it to herself and reminds herself immediately. She switches immediately to all the things that the Lord has done and how much she has to be thankful for. My, my mama ward, my grandma ward, is loved, loves Jesus. She's been walking with Jesus for many, many, many years. Through sadness and heartache, she still beams with the joy of the Lord. Last week, my family and I had the privilege to spend a little bit of time with Beak one evening. And Beak, you know, was here last week, and he obviously runs the, or- the, the orphanage House of Love in India. And I had the, the opportunity to ask Beak to tell me his story. I said, Beak, please tell me, how did you come to know Jesus? And Beak started telling me that and all these other stories and, you know, heartache and tragedy that my mind and probably a lot of ours in this room can't fathom. And a lot of you know, know a lot of the stories, maybe probably more so than me, of Beak's story. What, but what was so interesting to me is as, I, as I'm sitting across the living room from Beak and he's telling me a story that had incredible heartache and tragedy, the joy of the Lord was beaming through Beak. It was on his face. And as I would 
re- respond to what he was saying, he would stop and he'd look at me multiple times and he'd say, yes, brother, the Lord has been so good. He said it multiple times. Beak understands the joy. There is a joy in him that is otherworldly, and it comes from Jesus only. Christians, we have so much to be joyful about. So much. Our sins have been forgiven. We're no longer slaves to sin. Man. I mean, God looks at us and he sees the righteousness of Jesus. Right? We have hope and we have peace that cannot be explained. There's so much to be joyful about. The the final point that Paul makes about staying on mission is, he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Reasonableness can also be translated as gentleness. Some of your your Bibles might say gentleness. It also can be translated as magnanimity. Yeah, I had to look that one up big time. Uh, And one of the commentaries I read as I was studying for this the, the commentator says this about magnanimity. He says, that word keeps company with such words as peaceable, good, pure, peace-loving, open to reason, and rich in mercy. Magnanimity is that considerate courtesy and respect for the integrity of others, listen to this, which prompts a person not to be forever standing on his right. And it is preeminently the character of Jesus. Paul's point here, when he says, let your gentleness, let your magnanimity be known to everyone, his point is that Christians must be different. We must be different. We cannot be consumed or distracted by quarrels. While the world complains, we are to be filled with joy. And while the world tells us to get ours and where to find it and how to fight for it and to protect it at all costs, Jesus says that the first will be last, and the last will be first. Jesus says when we're slapped in the face to turn the other cheek, right? The Lord's ways are not, I'm sorry, the ways of the Lord are not the ways of this world, right? It's it's different. We are to be different. Our fleshly instinct is to fight and to defend and to claw, but if the mission is to bring Jesus to our neighborhoods, what does that look like, right? When the when our kids are being mistreated by neighborhood kids, when the guy who walks his dog across our yard and doesn't clean up the mess for the 15th time this month, right? When you're on your daily commute and you're driving and you get cut off by that jerk who's always you know, cutting you off, or when you're in line at the grocery store and the lady just comes and gets right in front of you and everybody else, is this just me? Is this only the one? Am I the only one who gets mad about this stuff? I'm kind of telling on myself right now. Um, but no, this is <clears throat> letting our gentleness be known to everyone. It means being okay with our agenda getting messed up. Right? Letting our gentleness be known to everyone means being okay with our agenda getting messed up. This is part of the gospel mission that we are all on. So I say point number one, stay on mission, because it's so easy to get distracted from the mission. What is the mission? What's the mission of the Grove Church, guys? To bring Jesus to neighborhoods, networks, nations. That's right. You guys passed the test. That is the mission of the Grove Church. That's what we're doing. It's what we're doing together. We're all on this mission together, but we got to stay focused on the mission. Okay, so point number one, stay on mission. Point two, and this pains me because I'm the son of a Baptist preacher. My dad, my mom and dad are both here today. It pains me, dad, I tried to make my points alliterated, tried to make them all start with S, and it didn't work. I spent way more time than I probably should have trying to figure out how do I make point two start with an S. Point number two is rest in him. Rest in him. Paul seemingly out of nowhere drops this in our lap and he says the lord is at hand or the lord is near why why does he tell us this the lord is near just kind of out of the middle of nowhere i would say the reason he tells us this is because it is the anchor for everything that he's talking about right we can do these things because the lord is near we can stand firm 
because the Lord is near. Paul then tells us, don't be anxious about anything, right? Which is, you know, as I'm prepping for this message, my first sermon, kind of like, you know, you hear this, the term, the Lord has a sense of humor. I can, you know, I can attest to that. My first sermon is, don't be anxious about anything, right? As I'm standing there, like, paper shaking. Um, so that was a nice little zinger from the Lord for me, but... <laughs> As my wife reminded me this morning, as she only can, like, hey, uh, maybe you should, you know, listen to the passage that you're preaching on this morning. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Paul tells us, do not be anxious about anything. He's very, Paul is very aware, by the way, of the persecution and the troubles that the church in Philippi was facing. Paul himself was writing this letter from prison, right? This guy understands persecution. This is not just a, hey, don't be anxious. Everything's going to be okay. We're talking about people who are going through it. And Paul understood that when he says this. This might be one of those Hobby Lobby verses, as Lance likes to say, right? This is, get, this is one of those verses that gets embroidered on towels and probably on a plaque in the bathroom at your Aunt Edna's house. This is one of those verses, but it is anything but trite. This is anything but just a throwaway verse. I mean, Paul is leaving us no room for anxiety and worry, no matter the circumstance, right? He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Paul's telling us that we can battle against anxiety and worry through prayer, through prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. It's important to note here that the nearness of God, which Paul starts with, the nearness of God is what allows us to pray and know that it's not in vain. We also know from Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, that Jesus not only hears our prayers, but he sympathizes with those prayers. That, that verse says, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, so Jesus is the high, pe- high priest, the great high priest. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Man, that's good. But one who is in every respect has been tempted as we have been tempted, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The definition for supplication, that's another one I definitely had to look up. Definition for supplication is the act of asking God or someone who is in a position of power for something in a humble way. The connection here that Paul is making is that when we're prone to worry and become anxious, that we talk to our Father. We plead and we beg with him through humility, and we have a thankful heart on the front end. Why is it important to have a thankful heart on the front end before we even know what the answer is? I'll tell you, it's a good question. Because the act of praying is as much about talking with our Father as it is aligning our hearts to his will. Let me say that one one more time. Because the act of praying, it's just as much about us talking with our Father as it is with aligning our hearts to his will. The key to not being anxious is to posture our heart to fully trust in the fact that God is in control. The thanksgiving part of this aligns our hearts to be grateful for whatever the Lord's answer is to our prayer. This next part that I'm getting ready to say, I just I want to say on the front end, I have permission to say, so you don't sit there worrying that I'm embarrassing anybody. Uh, But when our daughter Greta was in second grade, she's now in 10th grade, so... When she was in second grade, this is back when we lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, she went through a terrible bout of anxiety. And it ended up manifesting its way in a few, manifesting itself in a few different ways. And one of those ways was Greta began plucking out all of her eyelashes. I mean, at one point, she was completely bald. And her mom and I were, man, we were distraught. Not because her eyes were bald, but because we knew our little girl 
was going through it. We could see the, the trouble she was in internal, internally, the turmoil she was in. And we were desperate for a fix. We would have done anything to get our little girl back to normalcy. We, we didn't know what to do. We were desperate for healing and normalcy, and we would have, well, one of the things we did was try to find solace in talking with friends. Maybe, maybe we'll talk to somebody who's also experienced this. Nope, nothing there. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll Google it. Don't ever Google it. <laughs> I mean, that, woo, we were down a path of all kinds of craziness, right? Don't Google it. <clears throat> we, were, we were trying to figure out everything that we could. But like a self-professed mad scientist, Natalie found herself roaming the halls of a CVS one day, trying to create fidgets and jewelry from fake eyelashes. She, she was grabbing fake eyelashes and, and envisioning maybe gluing them to necklaces so that Greta had something to play with. And, and, and as she's standing there in the middle of the CVS, Natalie became instantly convicted of her futile efforts at trying to fix the problem. Natalie said that she realized she hadn't really prayed. She hadn't really begged on her knees to God our Father for our little girl. So she went home, and soon after, Natalie found a prayer group that met at a nearby church on a weekly basis, and it was called Moms in Prayer. And at that first meeting, Natalie prayed out loud for what we were going through, for this same, for exactly what was going on with Greta. And one of the ladies perked up, and she said, my daughter went through the same thing, almost around the same age. She said, <clears throat> she said that she, uh, she encouraged Natalie, but she promised to continue play, praying for our little girl. Natalie began bringing her worry and anxiety over our daughter to the Lord. And the Lord started doing something in the heart of Natalie, right? That was, that was part of the miracle. Natalie began bringing her worry and anxiety over to our daughter, and, and the Lord began doing a work in Nat's heart. And the comfort that brought my wife was immense. And me too. It was immense. Not only did she find a fellow believer with a similar experience, but more importantly, she found respite in the arms of our loving Father through prayer. If you were to ask her about that experience, Natalie will tell you that's one of the most formative experiences of her Christian walk. I know some of you in this room, <clears throat> I know some of you are dealing with really scary things right now. Very real and scary things. And I know there are people waiting for test results. I know there are people having bumps and biopsies evaluated. I know that there's sick babies dietary restrictions, behavioral evaluations with your kids, job loss, debt piling up. There are real issues that we're going through. <clears throat> like Natalie, like Natalie's story, I'm not making light of, these very, of the, all of these serious things, but I want to ask, have we stopped to think that maybe one of the reasons God's allowing these difficult circumstances in our life is because it's drawing us closer to him. Like Natalie, like her story with Greta, I know she wouldn't want to relive that. I know she wouldn't. And I know she wouldn't wish that on anybody in here. But in the end, it drove her closer to her father. It made her realize her dependence on him and how little actual control we have over our children. Would you still want to fix your circumstance that you're in right now if you knew it would bring you closer to Jesus? If you knew that that circumstance was bringing you closer to him, would you still want it fixed? Paul tells us that the Lord is near because he knows it's what anchors our souls while we're standing firm. We can set aside personal agenda because the Lord is near. We can squash disagreements because the Lord is near. We can have joy in any circumstance. We can be gentle and rich in mercy because the Lord is near. We can be anxious about nothing because the Lord is near to us. 
We can pray and tell the Lord a request, and we can be thankful because the Lord is near. Paul then goes on to tell us, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The command to not be anxious, but rather to pray and be thankful, it comes with an incredible promise, y'all. It comes with the promise of God's ultimate peace. His ultimate peace will be upon us. This is a peace that's so great that it baffles the minds of humans. The Greek phrase here for will guard your hearts and minds that's in this passage, it's a military term and it's likened to a group of soldiers standing guard or standing watch over a city. And back at this time in, in Philippi, there, there was a garrison of Roman soldiers that was watching over that city. They were stationed in that city. So this would have been a very real, vivid picture to this church as they read this. In one commentary I read, it says this, that the church in Philippi would have read this passage like this, that God's peace, like a garrison of soldiers, will keep guard over our thoughts and feelings so that they will be safe against the assaults of worry and fear as any fortress. This is an unbelievable promise. It should bring us great relief in times of worry and trouble. And one last thing about this, Paul says that God will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And I just, I want to point out, because I think it's important distinction here, it shows that this, these promises, this promise, it's available to believers. Unbelievers, if you're, if you're listening to me today, you cannot enjoy this benefit of peace. It's not for you. And so I beg and I just plead with you that for this reason, among many others, like your sins being forgiven, being right with God and communing with your Savior, don't leave here today without talking to somebody about this. This benefit is not here for you. And for us believers, those of us who have placed our trust and our faith in Christ, many of us, don't claim this promise, and we don't cling to it like we should. God's promises are all yes and amen in Jesus. This promise is real. It's for us. We must cling to it when worry and anxiety and doubt starts creeping in. We must claim this. Third and final point. Third and final point is setting your mind. Setting your mind. Paul closes this passage by telling his church, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. What Paul is saying here is that what we think about matters. What we think about and fill our minds with, it matters. Romans 8, 6, Paul says, To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Paul is linking our peace with what we fill our minds with. If you think back to the times in your life when you're filled, when you are anxious and you're worried, were you dwelling on was your mind filled with things that are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely or commendable? No. No, at those moments, our minds are filled with what-ifs and doubt. For those of you that might be struggling with anxiety of the unknown, there's a great quote that I want to share with you. It's one that's been very um, important in the life of my wife and I. Um, it's, and it's from a missionary, Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth Elliot's husband was killed by the very tribe of people that, that they were witnessing to. And Elizabeth Elliot says this about struggling, about worrying and anxiety of the unknown. She says, there is no grace for the imagination. There is no grace for the imagination. In other words, God provides grace to help us through actual trials but not the what-ifs that we begin conjuring up into our minds. We allow fear and anxiety to build when, when we lose focus of truth, and that's why Paul is telling us to set our minds on the things that are true. 
Paul says back in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, which we just read before my message. It says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Right? And then he goes on to explain to us, what is the mind of Christ Jesus? Jesus, he, he left the comfort and glory of heaven, and he came down to earth in human form. He submitted to suffering, the suffering that was necessary for his Father to be glorified and ultimately for us to be saved. <clears throat> this is the calling of the Christian, guys. This is our calling. It's not health, wealth, and prosperity. It's not it. The times of suffering are going to come. Times of suffering are going to come, and the test of anxiety and prayer is whether we're going to set our minds on him and take on the form of a suffering servant like Jesus, or are we going to want to sit on the throne? Are we going to want to be in charge? Are we going to want to call the shots? Because Jesus did not. He left all of that. He submitted himself to suffering for the sake of God and ultimately for us to be saved. That's why Paul says, have this mind in you which is in Christ Jesus. What we think about matters. I'm close with this. I started my sermon with the illustration of Louis Zamperini holding that beam above his head for 37 minutes with the threat of being shot if he failed, right? If I were to leave us today with just that image, that would be a massive failure on my part because that image makes us feel, and, and at least in my mind, conjures up this idea of like we can, we can fight. We can do this, right? We can battle and have enough determination to fight against whatever is opposing us. The fact is, we cannot. We cannot stand firm on our own power. We are weak, and we are frail, and we are incapable. There's only one way to stand firm, and that is in the Lord. He alone is our strength. He alone has the power to overcome sin and flesh. He alone gives us hope to battle against anxiety and worry. He alone can promise and deliver a peace that surpasses all understanding. He alone has conquered the grave on our behalf. So the image that we must leave here today is not one of Louis Zamperini holding this beam above his head for 37 minutes. Right? The, the image that we must leave with today is one of our sinless Savior with his, his hands nailed to the cross. That's the image. That's where our power comes from. That's where our ability to stand firm in Jesus. And the only way we can stand firm is in Christ alone. Let's pray. Father, so very grateful for your word. I'm grateful that even though we are prone to worry, we're prone to have anxiety, we're prone to want to fight on our own and stand on our own, God, you have given us your word, you've given us peace, and you've given us hope that is real. You've given us the promise that you will guard our hearts and our minds if we bring our troubles and our worries to you and you love us. I'm so grateful that you're a God who can actually empathize and sympathize with what we've gone through because you've walked this life. You know what it's like to be tempted and yet you sin not. God, I pray that you'll help us as we leave her today to stand firm, but to stand firm in Christ, to understand that we cannot do it alone when we're not designed to do it alone but rather in you and through you. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.